One of the things I like to do as a host on this broadcast is to invite people smarter than me and to ask them stupid questions, and then they give me really smart answers. I've done this in the past with my special guest today. His name is Dr. Josh Bowen, probably best known as Dr. Josh. He is an Assyriologist. Dr. Josh Bowen, for those who don't know what an Assyriologist is, would you enlighten us, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's it's basically just going to school to study for, you know, 10 years or so to uh, learn all about the languages and cultures of ancient Iraq and Syria. So, you know, we study the languages of Sumerian and Akkadian and, um, you know, depending on what you do, I, I learned Hebrew as well. Um, along with, you know, Aramaic and some other languages. But, um, yeah, it's just, it's basically trying to understand um, ancient Iraq from maybe, you know, 3,000 to 300, roughly, BCE. I mean, you do this for pleasure? It just sounds like the kind of shit that they would test me on in school, and I would just be like, oh, God, how am I going to pass this class? Like, are you that much of a nerd? Hey, I am. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, I married another Assyriologist, so you know, I think I'm doubly a nerd, I guess. We're talking about a book that you have released. It's called The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. I'm interested. I'm kind of irritated. I'm sorry, you caught me right off of a tweet by uh, a guy that I really like. His name is uh, Pastor John Pavlovitz. And for all practical purposes, he's just a humanist. He just loves people, and he's pissed off about the evangelical Christian nationalists. And he and I line up on a lot of stuff, but he keeps tweeting that the Bible is not the enemy of homosexuals and the Bible is not anti-gay. And of course, I, I'm like, have you read the Old and the New Testament, right? <laughs> John, John, have you read the Bible? And of course, I, I will respond and say, dude, I, I hate that these verses are in here. But here in Leviticus, and here we jump over to Romans, and here in 1 Corinthians, I mean, the Bible is overtly anti-homosexual. You address that in your book, John? Uh, it, it actually will be in volume two of this particular series. So um, volume one covers a bunch of stuff, uh, but I, I was going to have it all in one book, but it's it's a little over, it's about 450 pages now. And so I had a bunch of stuff written, and I thought, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna I'm gonna push some of that stuff over into volume two to keep the the book from you know being too cumbersome for people. Just but yeah, casually be... then. I mean, we're just talking over coffee. I mean, what would you say to somebody like Pastor John who comes forward and says, "Well, you know, the Bible's a love book, you know, through yeah. and through." How would you respond? Yeah, I think there's a tendency nowadays, uh, particularly with certain theological approaches, which, by the way, I'm very much in favor of in comparison to other theological approaches, um, and, and those that would say, we need to read the Bible differently, you know, we, we understand that, you know, homosexuality is not wrong, we understand that slavery is bad, we understand that, you know, you shouldn't stone children for being rebellious, right, we, we understand those things. Um, and so we need to re-evaluate how it is that we understand the Bible, and can we read it in such a way that it can still say all these terrible things, but we understand a like a bigger picture. Uh, we understand that God might have been doing something bigger than this. Like I disagree that that's what's happening. Like I, I, I think it's just a book, but um, I'm much more in favor of people interpreting it that way. Uh, than I am people taking it in a sort of more the fundamentalist approach. But, the, you know, the reality is, if you're asking the question, if people are asking the question, what is it that the, you know, the Old Testament, the New Testament say about something like homosexuality, there's this tendency to sort of whitewash it, like they do, with, you know, like people do with slavery. It's like, well, it's, you know, it's not, it's not so bad. The sl slavery is not so bad. Um, and I think that sort of thing also happens with um, homosexuality. So in the final form that we have, um, you know, the Old and New Testaments, I don't think there's any question that um, the Bible is condemning homosexuality. Uh, that, I mean, I think that's just something we have to, you know, people that are going to take a theological approach that says, um, 
God, God is, you know, love and, 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 and isn't against homosexuality has, to, I mean, they have to wrestle, I think, with those passages. Cause I think that's, I think that's clearly what they say. I mean, Josh, don't you want to just grab him by the shirt collar and say Sodom and go more? I mean, I, for me, that's probably right there. I mean, which let's say it's a lesson, a parable to help teach us about goodness in life. What is raining sulfur upon mm. non-heterosexuals? What, what life lesson are we to glean from that? I don't know. I mean, is that a valid way to approach? Because that's one of my tactics. I'm like, somebody explain Sodom to me. Like, how did that, how'd that go, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, Sodom and Gomorrah is obviously an interesting story because I think it it, it has to do um, actually a lot with their lack of hospitality. But But I mean, you know, the broader point uh, about homosexuality in the Old Testament, I think is just, it stands. I mean, there's, it's hard to read through Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, um, in its final form and try to argue something other than the Bible, the Old Testament condemns homosexuality. I mean, we have a video on our channel where we talk about, um, what those passages may have originally said, um, before they got edited and re-edited, but I mean, people that follow, uh, people that base their theology on, on the Old Testament aren't basing it on what earlier versions of it may have said or earlier, um, you know, traditions may have said. They're, they're basing it on what it says in their King James Bible, right? So, well, I got to um, jump in here, all right? Uh, how do you even know that? How do you get there? Oh, well, we've got the KJV, but then we jump into an earlier version, then an earlier version, and then we're scrambling to find out, because we don't have original manuscripts, right? So how do you even begin to decide what is the, the word accurate is not even the word I want, but you know what I mean? Like, how do yeah. we, how do you get back? How do you reverse engineer the Bible to a point where you're at least as close as you can get? Yeah, I mean, texture, that's the practice is called textual criticism. And uh, like we have, uh, <laughs> I took almost six months or so and did a whole bunch of videos on this on our channel trying to go through how that actually works. Um, but it's complicated. I mean, there's no question that it's complicated. As you said, we don't, you know, we don't have any of the originals. And it's, it's what makes studying a seriology so neat is because we do we do have the originals right because they were written on clay tablets so we we get to pick up these you know five thousand year old tablets and hold them in our hands um, you don't have that in the Bible either in the Old or the New Testament you have much later copies of copies of copies um, so it's complicated you know you have to look at different you know ways that the different manuscripts compare to one another the var the variations that they have between them now if it's i a put like 20 of you guys in a room and you're all experts in mesopotamia etc would you guys be duking it out like would you all be disagreeing because this is uh, common among people you know when you're talking about these vagaries of history so that's a good question um and yes and no is the answer and and actually this is something that i go into in a fair amount of detail in the book um because there is this idea i think among people that are outside of the field of like biblical studies that think well they all disagree about everything and so you know those those you know liberal scholars those critical scholars they can't even agree amongst themselves so we should just stick with what the Bible says, you know, here in English. Um, and so the, the problem is that most, you know, if you were to put uh, 20 scholars in a room and say, um, how was the Pentateuch, for example, how was the first five books of the Bible, how were they put together, how were they formed? All 20 are going to agree on a whole lot of foundational things, right? Not written by Moses, written at you know, over an extensive period of time by a bunch of different people, um, you know, or several different people. There are different traditions that go into it that are kind of brought together and edited and then re-edited. Um, they're all going to agree on those things. Where they're going to duke it out are the minutia, right? Well, I think actually that the way this worked is there's this early recension that gets, you know, um, 
but they're not going to be disagreeing on stuff like did Moses write it? <laughs> There's no question about that one. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's important for us to recognize um, that the reason that scholars disagree is often not because of these core foundational uh, to them elementary things that you can't do any more research without agreeing on uh, because it's just the, the data is clear. Um, it's more in the fine tuning of their particular arguments that they disagree. I've got callers on the switchboard. Some people have some questions for Dr. Josh. I've got uh, 785. Who's this? This is Cam Amos. You probably know me as Camus from Phasmophobia, but let me let me set this me? up. I do a little bit of online gaming on Twitch, and my game of choice lately has been a ghost hunting game called Phasmophobia. And Cam has been a frequent ghost hunter, and I think maybe the only player to die on the game more often than I do, and it's awesome. Well, yeah, probably so. <laughs> so I just want to give I a just little had, back. I just wanted to. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, when I saw who you had on here, I was actually not, but yesterday I saw this as a recommended book to be uh, looking at, and I am excited that you have written it because I am an ex-evangelical, um, and it was going through this uh, uh, Old Testament. I decided to, uh, you know, go through the Old Testament, the entire Bible, read it from cover to cover, and then as for many people, that's what got me to deconvert. Mm. So uh, the fact that you've written this book, I you definitely got me. I'm going to definitely buy it because I want to see what your take on it is because I've been doing a lot of writing it myself in regards to the Old Testament, how it conflicts with it, you know, itself. And there's so many, it, it, even with, uh, you know, I don't know if you're a fan of TikTok, but I go through TikTok and I've got a, there's a, a whole bunch of people that I follow that do the same thing, but, I'm just, I'm, I'm excited about the book and uh, even just to be able to sit here and talk to you is exciting it, as well as Seth. I love you, Seth. But <laughs> Thank you, brother. Cam, when you're writing about the Old Testament as somebody who's now looking sort of reverse engineering your own faith, what are your thoughts when you see the Old Testament now as opposed to probably seeing it as a, as a love letter when you were a believer? I mean, just a few bullet points of some mm -hmm. of the stuff that's been on your mind regarding the OT? Well, you know, uh, as, as far as that goes, it's kind of been a, well, see, I first claimed myself as an atheist in 2014, uh, right after I, closed, I, I read the last book of the, the God Delusion from Richard Dawkins, and as soon as I closed that book, I said, oh my God, I'm an atheist. And from that point on, it's been kind of a, a uh, an evolutionary thing from thinking that I've been duped by the Bible to being angry about it, to now, to this point in time of day, I can read the Old Testament and laugh. It's a humor thing now for me, and most of my writing is involved in the humor aspect of how funny it is that light existed for several days before the fucking sun was created. I mean, that kind of thing just, it, it makes me laugh. It, it's, it's hilarious to me, and I, I've actually gone through and written about all these different things that I don't know. So it, it's it's a it's a comedy thing now for me, and I try not to use that to mock Christians with. It's very difficult not to, whenever I talk to them, because. Uh... Whoop! Did I lose you? I may have lost him. Sorry, Cam. Doctor Josh Bowen, is do you consider that like the low hanging fruit? Like when you study at your level, do you get into? How did we have light if the sun wasn't made to the fourth day? And why are there two conflicting, contradicting versions of the creation story in Genesis 1 and 2? And here's how the flood doesn't make any sense. I mean, you know, is this your playground, or have you, have you evolved past that? No, I, and this is one of the things that I think um, I, I feel right at home, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, in topics like that, and the reason uh, that I feel at home in it is, so I'm 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 in a position um, where I can spend time in, in engaging with these bad arguments uh, from apologists on social media, on YouTube, and um, you know Twitter, and these are the things that that people. Um, it's not foundational knowledge to them, right? It's not assumed knowledge. So if you go into, 
you know, Berkeley or you go to Yale or, you know, Hopkins or Harvard, you don't have to spend time arguing those types of things. Everybody just realizes there are two different creation stories, right? There's one in Genesis 1 and one in Genesis 2, and they're different. Um, But it's important for people in this community, uh, I think, to be able to understand the specific details of that. So looking at the order of creation in both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and seeing that they're out of order, right? They're, they're, they're not the same. When was mankind created? When were the animals created? Um, you know, did, were, were man and woman created at the same time or were they created separately? Uh, you know, the, the flood story, was it 40 days? Was it 150 days? You know, what? W- why is that? Uh, why is it relevant? Why is it problematic? And so I have a whole chapter dedicated to just that sort of thing, specifically to say, look, one person didn't write this. And that's a really important thing that you can't just take for granted when you, um, you know, talk to or debate or, you know, discuss things with people that are fundamentalist evangelicals. You can't just assume that they're going to go, oh, yeah, of course, you know, it wasn't written by just one person. Um, And so, I know, I think that's actually really important to be able to understand in the details and see what it is that they think and why it's problematic. What about the authorship of Genesis? Uh, That's one of my rudimentary questions, right? This is Christianity 101. Do you believe in Adam and Eve? Yes. Do you believe in a literal creation? Yes. Do you believe that the fall produced original sin, which infected humankind and ultimately required Jesus to come here and be sacrificed to rescue us from hell? Yes. Who wrote the book of Genesis, right? Who wrote the foundational book of the foundational book of the Bible, the foundational text of the entire Christian religion? Nobody knows, and nobody seems concerned that they don't know. Have you done this particular exercise, or maybe a better one? Yeah, sure. I mean, of course, most fundamentalists, um, and I would say even many just evangelicals, will say, well, Moses wrote it, right? Um, Moses, Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and all but the end of Deuteronomy. Um and of, of course, you know, biblical scholars will say, well, we've we've known that's not true now for hundreds of years. <laughs> um, but it's a it's a it's a critical thing, uh, I think. And certainly in the church that I grew up in or the churches that I grew up in, um, the, you know, I went to Liberty University for my bachelor's degree. I went to a conservative uh, evangelical seminary for my master's degree. Um, So it was very important. It was in my it was in my master's thesis, you know, that the fundamental presupposition of this thesis is that Moses wrote the entirety of the Pentateuch. I mean, it's just foundational. So, yeah, I mean, it's not that they don't think uh, it's not that they think, well, we don't know who wrote it. They they do know who wrote it. You know, it's it's Moses. And of course, it's just it's just not the case. So I think being able to there are two different questions here. One is who wrote it, and the other is who didn't write it. And while they seem, con- you know, they're obviously connected, it's important to be able to address the latter and to be able to say, look, we know that Moses didn't write this thing. Here is why. It's less important to me, although a very, it's, a, it's obviously an important question, but it's less important in this regard to be able to address how it was actually formed. You know, all right, so do we have sources, four different sources that are being brought together and woven together? Or do we have independent little traditions that are brought together and then expanded and then expanded again? Do we have major blocks that are then sort of fit together and then expanded on that? Those sorts of questions are obviously very important, but they're not as important in this in this uh, discussion because it's 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 simply a question of did Moses write it? And that's that's what the whole chapter addresses. I find it interesting, too, when I'm speaking to some people about it. We're going to get into some of the uh, atrocities in the Old Testament, many of the things that uh, Bible believers either don't know about or conveniently sort of uh, skip over. You know, they hopscotch past slavery and, and uh, you know, genocide, infanticide, human sacrifice, all that stuff. But I'll run into some people, and then they're like, well, that's Old Covenant. The Old Testament, that's the Old Testament. We go with the New Testament. That's the Bible we embrace. And I always thought that was interesting because I'm like, all right, fine. 
Does that mean that uh, all the anti-gay verses in the Old Testament are now irrelevant? Um, the Ten Commandments, I mean, that's Old Testament, right? Have you, you just sort of put white out over all ten of the commandments? The creation story, that's Old Testament. I always found that interesting. If, if, have you run into those New Covenant types, and what's your response? What's your approach? Yeah, uh, so I've, I've got a chapter on slavery in the, in the new book, and... You know, it, I, I wrote a book on slavery a while back, but I didn't really go into the New Testament or into early Christianity at all. But in this chapter, I did. And I did so specifically to address that question, because one of the things that's come up for me, and it's not a new argument, but it's come up recently on social media, is that, yeah, yeah, the Old Testament endorsed slavery. Um, but it was it was God sort of condescending to the people, to humanity, you know, he couldn't just come in and, and eradicate it because, you know, they would have fallen apart or they wouldn't have been able to handle it or their economy would have crashed. And so what he was doing was sort of working with them and trying to show them how slavery isn't moral. But then when you get to the New Testament, that's when God comes out and says, no, no, slavery is immoral. And the problem with that argument, uh, you know, the sort of old covenant, all right, Jesus comes, new covenant, you know, we get new stuff is that that's not what we see in the New Testament. So if you look at something like slavery, what you would expect to find is that Jesus would make, or Paul would make, or the disciples would make, these overt statements condemning the practice of slavery, of owning another person as property. And they don't. And not only do they not make those type of overt statements, uh, those types of overt statements, but they utilize them in analogies and metaphors all the time. You know, Jesus says in Luke 17 to his disciples, which one of you uh, having a slave working in the field all day, when he comes in would say to him, hey, sit down with me and eat dinner? No, of course not. You would say, get into the kitchen and uh, make my dinner and then you know, put on your serving you know, attire and come out here and serve me and wait on me until I'm done eating. And only then... Can you sit down and eat? Uh, so, you know, far from condemning the practice of slavery, uh, Jesus seems to, uh, you know, utilize it. Um, and certainly the early church didn't see any problems with uh, with owning slaves. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a nice thing to be able to say, and I think maybe in some cases you can make it work better than others. Uh, but the reality is that the New Testament is built, the New Covenant is built upon the Old uh, in many ways. And, um, and so I don't, I don't think you, it's not a get out of jail free card, I guess, because y you have these, these things that just don't go away. Jesus doesn't suddenly become a nice guy in, in the book of Revelation, right? He's, he's not coming back and patting everybody on the head and saying, so glad that you're here. <laughs> right, he's 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 killing them. So, um, yeah, it's not quite that quite that easy. I have on the switchboard eight zero three. Hi, thanks so much for waiting. You're on with Doctor Josh Bowen. Who's this? Uh, my name's Deese. So glad to meet you. I'm sorry. Say your name again for me. Deese. Uh, D e e c. Deese, thank you for calling, my friend. Question or comment for Dr. Josh? A uh, question. Um, kind of wondering how meaningful a concept as original manuscripts is when talking about something like the, the Old Testament. Because from my understanding, didn't it all start as kind of um, oral tradition that was passed down from generation to generation, mutating all the time until finally somebody put down the current version of the tales, you know, this, like I said, you know, wonder you know, if original manuscript is useful for scholarly con uh, uh, conversation and investigation. Yeah, that's a actually an excellent question. So there's this idea of um, like multiformity. So when you have um, oral traditions that are uh, passing on these these stories, and it's like certainly this is not my area of expertise. Uh, there are people that in the field that dedicate their entire careers to this, but I'll, I'll try to do it justice. Um, 
the, the, the question is, is there an original, quote unquote, autograph to go back to? And in some cases, I think that's a- absolutely the case, right? So if you have um, a letter uh, or a series of oracles, uh, prophecies that are or something, you know, written by Jeremiah or by Ezekiel, you know, th- these are things that are written by one guy. At least parts of them are written by one guy and then transmitted down. Uh, but when you're thinking about things like the creation stories, or the flood story, you know, or uh, any of these stories in the primeval history or the stories about the patriarchs, like these aren't things that are written by Frank, right? It's not like one guy sitting down and like writing this story. These things are being passed on in this oral culture, right, through oral tradition. And so what that means is you've got different different versions, different forms of the es- essentially the same story. This is the argument. And uh, so then when they start to uh, be, they start to be put down in writing, there's not this one original, perfect, canonical, whatever you want to call it, form that they're all trying to, to get back to. Um, what you end up with is different versions that people are copying out. And so then when you have these later manuscripts and you're looking back through them and you're saying, okay, what is it, you know, what, what is it that, um, you know, that this, this story was supposed to say, is it supposed to say 150 days or is it supposed to say 155 days? You know, and you compare the manuscripts, you say, well, the original story must have had 150 days. The question is, was there an original story is it, is it even meaningful to talk about that? Um, and a good example of this actually might be, um, the, the, uh, my, I wrote my dissertation on these religious liturgies from the early second millennium BCE. And we have uh, basically their prayers that are written out by these priests. And if you've if if you have ever or you know someone who has ever given a prayer at like um, something like an invoke, I mean, a uh, like a ceremony or even at something like Thanksgiving dinner, if somebody's come up to you and said, hey, would you mind giving the 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 prayer before the meal? Depending on how formal that is, you might actually write it out. And I've done this. I was a pastor for seven years. So I've done this several times. Well, there are certain phrases that if you were a Christian, you probably used, right? Like uh, the way you opened your prayer or Lord, you know, uh, bless this food to our bodies. May we serve you uh, from the strength we get from it with the strength we gain from it or something. Sort of these stock phrases that we use. But so you might add those in, but the body of the prayer is going to be different each time. So even though if you were to see 10 different prayers of mine, and they all ended with this, may we serve you with the strength we gain from it, you know. Um, you wouldn't say that these are different versions of the same prayer. They just have sort of stock phrases that are inserted into each one, but they're all different. So looking for an original version of that prayer might not be even meaningful. What would that even mean? There isn't an original version. Um and so again, it's 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 different in many respects, but there's a it's analogous to it. Um, that's that's a tough question to try to figure out. Is there an original? Sometimes yes, I think. Other times maybe not. Um, maybe not. I'm sure everybody in the audience is wanting to know your dog's name because <laughs> I hear a puppy back there. Oh, what? Yeah, was it wasn't mine? Is that what's going on? <laughs> yeah. That- that that would be Maggie. Uh, Django and Sam are being quiet on the couch. Now, Maggie is she is uh, disturbed about the inconsistencies and atrocities in the Old Testament, and wanted to voice that. And I appreciate- and the lack of snacks that were given to dogs in the old days. <laughs> Maggie, the you know <laughs> the skeptic, the skeptic dog, has come to be a part of. Did that uh, answer your question, my friend? Or you know, do you have anything else you wanted to follow up with? Uh, I I think that threw some. Uh, I think that there's some nice light on, on how to consider it. Uh, the only other thought, you know, thought that kind of came up to me during that is uh, how likely it was that there were possibly m- multiple scholars starting to write down these tales at the same time, each 
with their own little tweaks. But I think the analogy to uh, to the transcription and preparation of prayer kind of fits in with that. Let's jump into that real fast. I'll do it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the call, and you go take care of the critters. But uh, we'll follow up quickly, okay? Uh, and you can put me on mute. No worries. Thank you, brother. Uh, I think Good. that's an interesting thing. I mean, you know, we, we see Christianity, which is um, came to prominence in a time when we were looking at uh, these sort of genre religions. You know, you had one religion says, oh, look, they've got a God that has a virgin birth. You know, maybe ours will have a virgin birth. Oh, look, they've got an all-powerful God that takes you to heaven, posthumous existence, or maybe that God did this or that or, or died in some sort of passion. And, uh, you know, I, I, we've done a lot of talking about how it almost became a popularity contest. Oh, you know what? The people, the, the cultural, uh, the popularity of a specific religion is for this type of God. So let's sort of borrow from the best parts of that as we manufacture our own God. I don't know. Is that even washing with you? Is there some truth to that? Yeah. I mean, I think we think very differently today from, you know, what what they did. So uh, the example that I always give is uh, there's a very, you've probably heard of it, a very um, popular, very important text from the ancient world in Akkadian, and it's called the Enuma Elish. And it's it's basically the, the Babylonian uh, creation story. And it features this god, their, their main god, Marduk. And Marduk does battle against the sea and defeats it. And, uh, and he's, he's, he's made supreme god over the other gods. Well, this text was recited. It was it was recited annually at this New Year's festival down in uh, down in Babylon, and is incredibly important. Um, had to be recited every year. You couldn't have the New Year's festival if you didn't have the king there to you know to have it recited. And there was. Of a group that was very close to the Babylonians. They were called the Assyrians, and they were up to the north in, in, in Iraq and Syria. And uh, at, they, they fought a lot with each other, but they revered the same deities in, in many ways. But the Assyrians had their main god. It wasn't Marduk. It was a god named Asher. And one year, uh, the Assyrians got really mad at the Babylonians, and they, they went down and really beat them up real bad. And one of the things that they did is they took a whole bunch of their, their important tablets, you know, their cuneiform tablets, back with them um, to, uh, to Assyria. And one of the tablets that they took was this story of uh, the Enuma Elish, the story of Marduk, creating the world and becoming the most powerful deity. And we have copies of the Assyrian version of this story that came from after that. And what they did is they this, this story remained almost identical, but they took out the name Marduk in every place that it occurred, and they replaced it with the name of their god, Asher. So instead of the story being about Marduk and how he defeats the sea and you know creates the world and gains prominence over the other gods, now it's Asher, their god, that does that. And it's really important to recognize that they knew the story. They knew the story was originally about Marduk. They knew that. But there was something powerful about just replacing the name and saying, no, no, this is about our god. This is about our deity, not your deity, right? Our deity is the more powerful one. And so when you come to Genesis 1, for example, and you read when God began to create the heavens and the earth, um, that story, it talks about God was hovering over the deep, or it was, you know, it was, it was upon the face of the deep and his spirit was hovering uh, over the face of the waters. The word there for deep in the Hebrew is to home. And it's a it's a cognate of the word Tiamat, and Tiamat was the goddess that Marduk killed, the goddess of the sea. So, my point is that the writers, uh, the the priestly writer that wrote Genesis one, knows about the Enuma Elish, knows about this story, 
And what he's doing is he's putting his own spin on some of the details from that story and saying it wasn't Marduk, it wasn't Asher, it was Yahweh. And that's the point. So when we read through these stories, I, th- I think when when like young earth creationists, for example, come to Genesis 1 and they're trying to figure out, all right, scientifically, how does this work? They're missing the point completely. It's not a scientific text. It's not meant to be a scientific text. It's a story that says, our God did it. Not yours, not yours, ours. And uh, I think that sort of thing is really important to understanding aspects of things like borrowing or utilizing. You know, just one more thing really quick, just by way of analogy. You familiar with Eminem? Eminem came out with an album a couple years ago, and and on it he redid uh, a song, uh, I Love Rock and Roll. I can't remember who sings it. Joan Jett, if Uh, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yep. Yeah. So he he reworked that song into his rap, and uh, and I won't you know perform it or anything because you know I want to keep the audience watching. But um, it's very clear that he's utilizing that song, but it's not that he's stealing it. It's not that he's plagiarizing. What he's doing is he's reworking it to get his own message out, and he's he it's a genre. It's something. It's it's utilizing the genre. And saying, I'm, I, I know the audience is familiar with this song, and I want to borrow some of the, 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 some of how this song was used, what it meant, its style, but I want to rework it into mine to make a different message, but one that's familiar with the audience, you know, artistically, and that's what's going on in so many of these texts. So. Uh, up at Ugarit, you have this uh, this god Baal or Baal. You guys have probably you know heard it said in the, in the Old Testament. Baal. Baal was called the Rider on the Clouds. But when you read through the Psalms, Yahweh is called the Rider on the Clouds. And the reason that he's called that is because it's saying not Baal, not Baal, Yahweh, our God. He's the one that's in control of the storm. That's the point. I've got Lee on the switchboard. Thanks for waiting on me. Lee, you have a comment or question for Dr. Josh Bowen? Hi, hello. Um, Yes, I do, as a matter of fact. Um, And just like to say good morning, Seth. (laughs) Um, It's a first-time caller. uh, But, yeah, I had some questions because I remember reading the Old Testament and kind of the impressions that I got from it were that, um, you know, attitudes towards like deities, gods and such aren't quite the same as, as they are today and such that, um, like, for example, you had like national gods. I mean, that was the impression that I got, especially when I was reading about, um, like the Philistines and, and Dagon or Dagon, or I don't know how you pronounce that, but they all, they, but it seems like every kind of tribe had its own particular god that would kind of lead them into war and deliver them victory. And, I mean, they had, like, gods of the elements and stuff, but the, the elements were kind of the ones that they, you know, identified with. In other words, you know, if you lived in the mountains, you worshipped a mountain god. If you lived in a, you know, in a valley full of fields, you worshipped, you know, whatever, a grain god or a field god, I don't know what. But, um... Yeah, I definitely got the sense that, you know, people weren't, people didn't kind of like have, I mean, like today, today, like, you know, monotheism, monotheism is like a very well ingrained idea in people's minds. But, but, but back then, you know, people just kind of worshiped the God that, that, that did what they, they did what they wanted them to do. So if, Suddenly, you know, you pray to this God and they didn't deliver you a harvest. Or if you pray to this God, you didn't deliver a victory in a battle. Then you, suddenly nobody wanted to worship that God anymore. You know, people, didn't, I don't think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I don't think people had like this kind of, you know, die hard devoutness towards one God or the other at that time. You know, they just 
kind of worshipped the gods that kind of delivered on whatever the promises were that or they were supposed let me jump to be in. giving. Let me, let me see if I'm tracking with you. Thoughts are, are let me see if I'm that? tracking. Okay, Lee? So I think if I'm understanding your point, yeah. for clarity, you're saying that you think that if it was an agricultural community, then for them an agricultural god, the god of the harvest made sense. If it was a warlike tribe, then you know a, a god of war would be more in order for them. These were reflections of the regions and cultures. Their gods were essentially echoes of the flavor of tribe that it was. Would that be a, a rephrasing of what you were saying? Yes, but 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 more than that, because you know, like I especially remember like reading throughout the the Old Testament, and you know they they would bring the the um, oh god, I can't believe I forgot the word for it. The ark, of, the the ark, you know, ark of the covenant <laughs> into battle. You know, they were leading him into battle, and they were supposed that was supposed to deliver him the victory. So whoever was a stronger god. You know, in the Philistine, Philistines, they had Dagon or Dagon or whatever, and the the Jews they had Yahweh. So this is this is the God of our people, and the the idea the idea that kind of came, came across my mind is like all these laws, like all the Mosaic laws. You know, you had the Ten Commandments and the six hundred plus others. Those were to establish your national identity. This is say we are the Jews. This is what we do. We see what the rest of societies do, and we don't do that. This is what makes us distinct. This is what makes us us. And so this why that's a lot of the reason why some of those laws exist, which seem kind of ridiculous to us. A few of them. Some of them are like so common sense and stupid. And some of them are always, seem like so petty and so like, why even make a law about that? But um, I mean, that's the, that's the sense I got when I was reading the Old Testament. I'm like, oh, okay, this is like more like a sense of like, uh, this is who we are. I mean, they, they had laws about how you can cut your mustache and your beard. I mean, All right, hang on. who cares, right? There's but a lot to unpack God here. Cares. There's a lot of streamers on this lightning bolt right. here. So let me, let me hand it over to Dr. Josh. But I, right. uh, is he speaking to our gods are essentially a way for us to reinforce tribal boundaries and tribal identities? Is there some truth to that? Yeah. So one of the things that I think is important to recognize is that the worship of deities has you know, changed over time. Um, there's a lot of work that was done on this uh, by um, Jakobsen, I think, uh, the Assyriologist, who kind of looked at how how over the millennia um, BCE uh, worship changed from you know, these, the God of the lightning bolt or the God of the, you know, the storm cloud who then changed to worshiping, um, you know, these actual deities that are like the Kings, uh, personified like the Kings and, and so on. Um, so when you get into the, the, the old Testament, for example, uh, and the person that Lee, I would recommend that you read on this is a fellow by the name of Mark Smith. Um, lots of people have written on this, but I think Mark Smith, um, written, and, and I would recommend him. He's got a lot of work done on it. But the Old Testament is moving toward, the Hebrew Bible is moving toward monotheism. Now, what we what I think some people think about that is that there's, right, so there's one God and no other gods exist, right? And that's not really the type of monotheism um, that you see, at least in much of the, the Old Testament, what you see if you go to places like Deuteronomy 32 uh, or Psalm 82, you see this idea of there are all kinds of divine beings, right? And they're, they're, they're divine. If you like, go to Daniel 12, something as late as the book of Daniel, um, you know, the prince of, of Persia, the prince of Greece, these are divine beings that are over these nations, and they fight with each other. And this is a very old idea you see it in Mesopotamia back in the third millennium, where individual deities over cities or over countries are fighting with each other. And that plays out in reality, uh, you know, amongst the actual nations that are fighting. Um, so what the Hebrew Bible is trying to do, though, is to say, while there all are all of these deities, 
um, they are all subservient to ours. Right. There's it's not like there's a bunch of equal deities and our God is just another one among them. No, our God is the head God. And and like he's more powerful than all these other deities. Um, and, uh, and and it's, it's trying to trying to move toward that monotheism, I think. Um, and so, yeah, that, like there's no question what you were saying. If you if you um, remember the story about how. um the uh, king of Moab sacrifices his firstborn son up on the wall of the city when the Israelites are attacking. And uh, it would have been Chemosh, that, I, I guess, that would have um, gone out against the Israelites. And the Israelites were sent running because of the power of their deity who, who worked for them because you know, he sacrificed his firstborn son. And so it's very complicated, the interaction of these divine beings and what it is, the different voices that you see in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, with respect to them, who's who actually has power and who is a real deity and what's not a real deity and what does that mean? Um, it's, it's actually quite complex. I think you're absolutely right. This idea that there's one deity and then there are no other gods that exist isn't really something that we see throughout Um the Old Testament. Does that speak to uh, what we see in the first of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Yeah. The uh, writers of the Old Testament are now saying that there are a lot of other gods out there. And yeah. so it's a buffet, but you got to choose Yahweh. That's right. Don't worship the other ones. Worship me. Lee, I appreciate your call very much. I got to move yeah, on, my friend. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. I Thank mean, you did very you much for a, taking my call. Hang Bye. on, hold on. Did you have a follow up or something? Oh, oh no. I just, I just thought I'd throw that in there and just kind of bounce that off you and see how, see if my interpretation had any kind of, you know, any juice behind it, or if I was just talking out of my ass. No, no, it's all good, brother. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I appreciate the feedback, Doctor Bowen and, and Seth. I, 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 it's a pleasant to talk to you. Pleasure to talk, <laughs> Lee. If it if it and, if it um, helps at all in the in the book uh, in the, the atheist handbook to the Old Testament, I have a chapter on archaeology specifically about archaeology uh, and how it works and you know what biblical archaeology is all about. But I use two test cases to show how archaeology can you know help us interpret things, and one of them is child sacrifice among the Canaanites, and so it talks a great deal. Um, and, and references other works that talk about this, obviously, in much more uh, depth, um, about the different deities that, uh, you know, had had children sacrificed to them, and how Yahweh was one of them, um, how the Israelites sacrificed mm-hmm. um, children to Yahweh. So, you know, this idea of the complexity of, yeah. of uh, you know, the, the divine realm, um, yeah, at least we talk about it to some degree in the book, so... Lee, thank you for the call, my friend. Greatly appreciated. All right. Thank you, you too. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. We've spoken in the past on a show, and I'll leave it for that conversation if people want to look it up, uh, about the beating of slaves. And we talk about that verse where, uh, you know, if you beat your slave and he gets up within two days, the master is not punished. And there are some challenges with how we have interpreted that. Not that, not that it doesn't say that slaves can't be beaten or that slaves aren't happening. Slavery is not happening. But I'm interested in your approach. And Maybe you talk about this in the book. When I talk about biblical slavery, the apologist says, well, actually, it was indentured servanthood. Right? You know, they were just paying off the debt. It was a business transaction. This wasn't slavery, slavery. And your response would be what? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Even if even if we assume for a second, which it wasn't, that it was just indentured servitude, try it sometime. <laughs> yeah, you, you at the end you won't say, "Oh, well, this is just indentured servitude." Uh, but no, uh, there's there's no question whatsoever that uh, there's both debt and chattel slavery in the Hebrew Bible and the laws of the Hebrew Bible. Define those for and, me quickly, if you would. Debt yes, slaves and debt, chattel slaves. Yeah, debt slavery is just any type of slavery that is contingent upon the repayment of a debt. So usually that happened if I took out a loan and then I had a bad year uh, and couldn't repay the loan, I become your slave for six years. Uh, and then that, that loan is repaid. 
Um, but th those, so those are subject to release upon you know repayment of the debt. But chattel slaves are just movable property. They're just their owned property. So foreign slaves, if you look at Leviticus 25, 44 to 46, uh, foreign slaves can be taken as, uh, you know, inheritance. They're taken as, as movable property. And uh, they're passed on to your children as inherited property. And they serve for life. Uh, and their children serve you for life. So, uh, you know, if, e even if you had a debt slave and you gave that debt slave a wife to procreate with, the children, the wife, they uh, uh, of that, uh, the children of that um, of that relationship, they're yours. They're 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 property. They're chattel. They don't get released. There's no debt that um, you know can be repaid to release them. It's just they're yours. They're your property. So there's no question about that. And as you said, uh, you know, if if you read through Proverbs 29, you'll see that uh, slaves, in their minds, in in the minds of you know the the people in the ancient Near East. How do you get a slave to behave? How do you get them to do what you need them to do? Well, they, you beat them. That's what you do. Uh, you beat them with a wooden rod. Um, and that, that, that's considered moderate correction. Um, and that's, that's not only allowed. Um, this, the, the, uh, the proverb um, encourages it. It says if you don't do it, what, you know, it, it, that, that slave is going to become insolent. Uh, in the end. So, yeah, I mean, you, you'll be pampering them if you don't beat them. It reminds so me of the no biblical question. instruction for parents regarding children. You it's know, exactly the same. Beat yeah. your kids or else they're going to be fuck ups. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's I mean, I'm paraphrasing. It's, it's exactly the same, but it's exactly the same. I'm, that's not uh, a direct we, quote from the Old Testament. I'm just saying, <laughs> right. I just want that on well, the that's record. Well, the, that's the new Seth version. I, I'm talking here with Dr. Josh Bowen. He is an Assyriologist. He is author of the new book, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. I've kept you for a little bit. Do you have time for just a little bit more discussion here? Of course. Yeah, of course. I want to get into Old Testament prophecy. But before I do that, I've got Joseph on the line. Joseph, are you with me? Oh, Seth, hi. I'm first-time caller. Hey, and, man, um, you've got Joseph, uh, hello, you've got Dr. Seth, Bowen. and you've got Joshua. This is straight-up biblical Right here, I'm this telling you. convergence of biblical <laughs> names on the show. Uh, Joseph, uh, you have a comment or question for Dr. Joshua Bowen? Yeah, yeah, doctor. Do you have any or, or um, uh, anything on the curse of Ham, uh, doctor? As uh, specifically in regard to what? Noah's son. Yeah, sure, sure. I, I mean, but in what regard? relates to the Old Testament? The curse upon Ham in the Old Testament. Were you wanting to know, was it indicative of something else? Why was the curse there? Is there a reason to believe in the curse? I mean, give me, a, yeah. give me some expansion on what you're looking for here. Hmm, uh, well, I was thinking um, about the bad influence it had on everyone well i mean he's lost me a little bit but um, um so maybe how about i tell the sort of tell the story of it and then maybe it'll spark what, what specifically you're looking for good um so you know noah and the survivor of the flood um he brings his wife and uh his three sons and their daughters so eight people survive and immediately after they disembark and they you know um, provide an offering to Yahweh. Uh, Noah plants this vineyard, and uh, he gets drunk on the wine, and he falls asleep in his tent, and he's naked, and he falls asleep. And uh, Ham, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm just doing this from memory here, so if I mess up any of the details, I apologize. But Ham, it says, sees his father's nakedness. Right? I don't remember uh, exactly how the, the Hebrew phrases that, but it's in such a way that it's a little ambiguous. What does that mean? Does it mean that he just sees him naked? Um, does it mean that he there's actually some sort of sexual contact? You know, that's another another story. Uh, but then he goes out, and the other two sons put a, a like a blanket or a towel or something, and they go backwards into the tent and cover up their father's nakedness. 
Um, and then Noah wakes up and realizes what has been done to him. And so he curses not his son Ham, but he curses Canaan, who is Ham's son, so his grandson. And that's, of course, you know, from an etiological standpoint, from an origin standpoint, uh, you know, the fact that Canaan is cursed is a significant thing uh, in the in the Old Testament story, in the narrative of the Old Testament, um, which I have a whole chapter about the story, the actual narrative of the Old Testament. What is the story that the Old Testament is trying to tell? Um, but of course, Canaan is the you know the land that ultimately gets conquered. It's this wicked, horrible place where the seven nations live, the Canaanites, and uh, and they get wiped out, or you know, yeah. it's supposed to be driven out. Is so. this a version of like kind of an original sin thing? You, know, you trace it back to something carnal that took place. And now the, yeah, you know, the I mean, it's, it's it's yeah, it's trying to lay blame. Why is it that the Canaanites? What did they originally come from? Where well, they come from is terrible. You know, it's, I mean, look at all the horrible stuff that they did. So, um, yeah, that's right. Tracing it back to something bad. Joseph, thanks so much for the call, my friend. Greatly appreciated. You're welcome. Thanks, Joseph. I have six four seven Mike from Toronto. Are you with me, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you guys. How are you guys? Doing well. Have a comment or question? Can I tell you? Well, I just want to say before we get before I give you the comment, I'm looking at the TV, looking at you guys side by side. It's like a GQ magazine. It's unbelievable. <laughs> a devilish. <laughs> just stop. Wait, wait. We have to do a pose. Seth. Like I oh. look like Ferris Bueller for Pete's <laughs> sake. And Doctor Josh you Bowen, there, you definitely I'm have the close. you have the pastor look. Like yes. you, I can see I, you, you know, behind the pastor, you, you got the hip clothes, pastor. you got a cross <laughs> tattoo, you're singing Hill song. <laughs> I can see that. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. What's your comment or question, brother? Dr. Josh, I, uh, I, I was a pastoral student myself before becoming an atheist. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this is incredibly fascinating to me and I am dying to read your book. And I went online to buy it, but I couldn't find it anywhere. There was uh, Amazon, uh, Google, whatever. I couldn't. I can't find it anywhere. How do I get a copy of your book? Yeah, that's a good. That's it. Should be available right now on pre-order. So let me. Uh, Megan, my wife, is the brains behind the whole operation of of publishing. Well, let me jump in we, here. Let me jump oh, in here, and I'm just going to tell, uh, and I'll tell you, Mike, and the entire audience that I have the book link, I will put that in the description box, uh, both the podcast and the YouTube version will have a direct link to Dr. Josh Bowen's book. Sounds good. Appreciate you, Mike. Thanks so much. You, uh, Thanks, you, you gentlemen, have a nice day. All right. You too, sir. Very complimentary about, yeah. about us. Like me, all I know is that I'm doing softer and softer focus as I get older. Like I just saw focus please. and the camera is becoming more distant <laughs> as I get to just put the camera further away as I get older. Okay. Right, let's talk about prophecy before we ramp up here. One of the quote unquote proofs of the legitimacy and accuracy and invalidity, if that's a word of the uh, Bible, the old Testament is that it has been borne out. Fulfilled prophecy has been seen in the new Testament and beyond. How do you deal with, with these claims that prophecy is fulfilled. Yeah. Actually, I've got two chapters in the book uh, dedicated to that topic, and there'll be more in, uh, in volume two. But the two chapters that deal with it are the two big ones that you hear, at least two of the big ones. Um, the book of Daniel, of course, and uh, we have a whole chapter about when should the book of Daniel actually be dated to. Uh, it, you know, was it actually written in the sixth century and then predicts all this stuff that's going to happen? Or is it written in the second century, looking back at all the things that did happen? And of course, it's written in the second century. Um, but uh, the other one is the other popular prophecy, and that is the prophecy against Tyre in Ezekiel 26. So if, you know, your listeners remember, uh, Ezekiel prophesies that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is going to go and wipe out the island of Tyre, the island city of Tyre. And um, then Alexander the Great is actually the one that, that 
is able to breach the city walls. And so there's this idea, particularly as I now understand it among the Jehovah's Witnesses, that this one is like touted out as the, this is the big prophecy. And um, so I have a whole chapter dedicated to what's the prophecy about? Is it, you know, prophesying some future uh, ruler that's supposed to come like Alexander the Great and to destroy Tyre? Is it actually just supposed to be about Nebuchadnezzar? And of course we know, and <laughs> Ezekiel himself knew that uh, Nebuchadnezzar didn't do it, didn't do what he was supposed to do. So yeah, you know, the uh, th- those are two big ones that you hear about. Of course, the, the third one, the, the other one is about the Messiah coming uh, in Isaiah 53 and in Psalm 22 and uh, Isaiah 714. And so I have a whole chapter that's going to be dedicated in book two to just those three prophecies. Uh, so looking at this messianic expectation and uh, what's supposed to come and what's supposed to happen. Um, but yeah, prophecy, un- unfortunately, particularly something like Ezekiel 26, that's a bad one, I think, for apologists to use because it's the prophet himself says that it failed. And Ezekiel says in chapter 29, Nebuchadnezzar didn't get in, right? It didn't work. And then he makes another prediction that God's going to give Nebuchadnezzar Egypt in, 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 in lieu of have, you know, him not getting tired. And, and, and that doesn't happen either. We know historically that one failed. So uh, that's a bad one to use. So we, we go into the details. I mean, but the isn't there a priming that's going on? If you have all of these expectations in place, these previous writings, then the people who are in the New Testament or after writing about fulfilled prophecy, and they're kind of cheating because they sort of <laughs> they sort of know what the expectation is, and they yes. can formulate the fulfillment to sort of fit that narrative, or maybe just pattern seek until they see something that looks familiar and yes. say, "Aha!" Right? Yeah. There was a uh, there was a group. They may still be going, um, and it's the the congregation of Lord Ryel, R A Y E L. And uh, they, they're an American group that I moved down to Baja, Mexico. But it's, it's actually Jesus reincarnate um, who's with them. And it's very interesting. I had a debate with their, their public representative a couple of years ago on the Non Sequitur show. And in that debate, he pointed out all these things that were in the Old Testament that were actually fulfilled in like 2018. And it was so amazing. Like he pointed to uh, this particular flag that was down on the border of Mexico and, and, uh, and, and, and how it tied into this verse here in Exodus 19. And this is a direct fulfillment. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can, we can do that with a lot of stuff. You know, I mean, and and as you say, in the New Testament, they did exactly the same thing. You know, Jesus comes back up from staying in Egypt for a while and up out of Egypt. I have called my son. There it is. You know, Um, so, yeah, it's it's a little unfair to do it at the to do it at the end. (laughs) After you know what the prophecies uh, are. Let's finish with the shameless plug for the book, the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. People who pick this up and you should especially if you're engaged in conversations with Bible believers. What is in there and why is it important, Dr. Josh Bowen? Yeah, the whole purpose of the book um, is sort of the, thus far as the culmination of the work that I've done here on YouTube. Um, when I first got onto social media, it was to really come to the to the aid of atheists uh, online who are, I think, get bullied all the time, particularly by Christian apologists. And so the book is designed to arm, I I hate to use that sort of language, but that's that's sort of what it is, to equip, how about that, an atheist or a skeptic who debates the Old Testament with Christian apologists um, or other fundamentalists, family members, um, you know, people that you, you talk to at work. And if they say things like, "Oh, yeah, prophecy," there's all these un- these all these fulfilled prophecies in the Old Testament, uh, or no, slavery really really wasn't that that bad. 
uh, or Moses wrote the Pentateuch, you know, and, and, and that's, you know, that shows how the Exodus is true. Um, you know, any of these topics, uh, the book is designed to equip the atheist and the skeptic to be able to go, mm, actually, that's not what's going on here. So the way that I set it up is uh, each volume will have a chapter on the story of the Old Testament so that you can start off on the right foot with an apologist. It, you know, the example that I give in the book is 1 Samuel 15 uh, with the story of Saul, who's supposed to go wipe out the Amalekites. And we always use that one, right? We always say, how can you serve a God whose morality will call for the genocide of the Amalekites, killing the men, women, children, infants, cattle? Uh, how can you how can you serve a God like that? And I, I, I mean, I hear this all the time. And the Christian apologist will respond very quickly with, well, do you know the context of that? And if you don't know the context of it, if you don't know who the Amalekites are or what they did to Israel, the conversation just stops so, so often because, well, if you don't know the context, I don't even have to engage with you about it. So chapter one is designed to give you the context. What is the story of the Old Testament? Um, so it goes through in very plain language, explains the narrative progression. Then the second chapter uh, talks about the history of the ancient Near East. So when you, you you know you're talking to people and they say things like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, or they say uh, you know the the Neo Assyrians or the Amarna period. If you're talking about the Exodus, what does all that mean? It's all in chapter two, the whole uh, uh, history of the ancient Near East. And chapter three deals with archaeology and what archaeology is, how it works. What biblical archaeology is, and then it gives you know some some ways that people use it, um, and how we can use it when we talk about things like the Exodus, the conquest, or you know talking about the walls of Jericho, and what is it when the archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon says no, it's Jericho wasn't this major city that the Israelites took down, and here's the archaeological evidence about that. What does that mean? Well, that 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 chapter leads you into it. Um, and then the second half of the book of each each volume will deal with specific topics that are debated between skeptics and, and atheist skeptics and uh, Christian apologists. So the four in volume one are um, the dating of the book of Daniel, did Moses write the Pentateuch, uh, slavery in the Bible, including the New Testament and the early church, and then uh, the prophecy against Tyre in Ezekiel 26. Topics that will be covered in the second volume, if I can remember them all, are homosexuality, women's rights, uh, rape, and you know other other things that, uh, that that show up in the in the Old Testament. Now, what's the uh, ETA on that one? I mean, I'm not trying to pin you down, but do you think next no, no, year? Or? I'm hoping next year. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm writing the chapter on the Exodus and the conquest accounts. So you know. D- it was there an exodus, you know, of three million people from Egypt. What does the archaeology say about that? Um, so talking about that, talking about the the conquest accounts, but there'll be uh, a chapter on genocide. So looking at dev- at violence uh, in the Old Testament, and are these like are these really calls for genocide? Uh, and how do you you know how how do you talk to a Christian apologist who says things like, oh well, that's just that's just hyperbole. Right. You know, that's that's uh, they didn't really kill everybody. Uh, That's just hyperbole. Like, uh, you know, like when they say, well, the Steelers really massacred the Giants in last (laughs) week's game, you know, so that's all they're saying. How do you deal with that? Uh, That's Uh awesome. Yeah. All the tribal (laughs) wars in the Old Testament, they just showed up and used harsh language on them. Uh, that's yes. a great apologetic. I think. That's all it is. Yeah, it's really good. It's okay. really good. I'm going to put the uh, link to the book in the description box, and Thank I you. prophesy I now conduit of the Spirit's great oracle. I prophesy that the book will do well and be a great tool for those of us who are engaged with a Bible literalist, especially, and apologists out there as we continue our discussions, because, you know, it. If it's not true, it matters. If it's an exaggeration, mm. that matters. If it's immoral, if it's uh, you know, if, if it's just wrong, that matters. And we need to be on sure footing as we have those conversations. Doctor Joshua Bowen, thanks so much again for talking to me. It's always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. Thank you.